Good morning. Welcome to the second edition of the 59th annual Swahi Winter Course. A um, couple announcements real quick. There was a Visa gift card that was left here um, in this room, so if it's yours, based off of the honor system, this will be this will be fun. <laughs> so I'm holding it. If you if you really lost it, come and let me know, and then we'll get it back to you. If not, we're going to put it back in the raffle. So um, this session is brought to you by uh, JV Aviation and uh, Communiquest and WSP. Um, I know uh, yesterday I gave Mr. Trimborn all, all sorts of accolades for putting this program together, but I might have to rescind that. We're doing um, design standards at uh, 8.30 in the morning. So, I don't see him. Is he here? Okay, we're, we're good. <laughs> so, uh, with that, we're going to kick off uh, the morning, and uh, Bob Hamilton um, from Kimley Horn is the moderator of that, and he'll introduce all the speakers. Thank you very much. Good morning. As Brett said, my name is Bob Hamilton with Kimley Horn. Uh, for those of you who did not win it big at casino night last night and still need your day jobs, this is Airport Design Standards 101. Uh, it's been about five years since the <coughs> 5113A Change 1 came out, so our panelists are going to talk about some of their experiences with the uh, standards. So um, Rod Probst, who's the Deputy Director of Airports for the City of San Diego, is going to talk about what he needs to know about design standards as an airport manager, and then Mark Witso who is director of airports for Kern County, is, gonna talk, is going to discuss a case study at Meadow, uh, Meadows Field Airport. And then finally, we have Scott Van Gumpel, who's the aviation practice lead at Mead and Hunt. And he's gonna talk about some of the proactive things that you can do to stay ahead of some of the 13A related challenges. So with that, Rod. Thank you, sir. All right. RDP, get that up there. I can't do this without the PowerPoint. Before we start, I want to make sure everybody knows that we have not at San Diego killed Cooper. Yeah. Cooper, Cooper we hired after he graduated from Cal State LA and several of you called me and goes, you think he's going to live? I said, yeah, he'll be fine. So stand up, Cooper, let him know you're alive. Yeah. You know? We have a live video from your office. Well, we just, you know, he's working for a very laid back airport manager and I told Charlie, who is my airport manager at Montgomery. Just be good to Cooper and bring him along. And if he makes you crazy, just lock him up in the closet. <laughs> so have you well, been in the... Like twice. Just twice. Just twice. So. <laughs> well, this is an interesting topic, and I can tell everybody's excited because the room's almost empty. <laughs> uh, design standards at 8.30. So I, I, when I was asked... Actually, I asked Bob Trimborn, I said, I'll, I'll, I'll do this for you. And... Uh, I started thinking, you know, I've been doing this for 30 years, and um, since Bill Ingram retired and Bob Trimborn went to the dark side, I think I'm the oldest guy still doing this. Uh, I think Ingram was a little older, and, and I thought Carl Harnicker was older than me, but he's really not. He hasn't even drawn Social Security yet. So it's, it's a good thing. And all you young people, keep paying into it, Barney. So uh, two more years. Uh, so when I started this 30 years ago, I was the airfield officer at Camp Pendleton. I worked for a guy named Rick Jenkins. And I learned a lot from Rick, and he was pretty laid back, and I wasn't. And so I was pleased to see that I think his son is here from South Lake Tahoe, young Mr. Jenkins. Tell your dad hello. He's a great guy. We used to run at lunchtime, so till his back went out, and then he walked on the pier. So what are we going to do here? We're going to talk about design standards. And I approach this from the standpoint of what, what do I need to know as an airport manager, because I'm not an engineer, although I'm pretty good at reading blueprints. So I teach for a couple of universities, and, and one of the texts we use is Wells' quintessential text. And really, we get paid to safely and efficiently run the airports that we're responsible for, safely and efficiently. So when my boss says, why am I paying you so much? Because I safely and efficiently run your airports. Some of you remember Larry Gazelle. When we were over at the Marriott 20 years ago, uh, he and his team ran the short course for us. And then we kind of figured out as a group that we could probably do it as good as Larry. 
but in his textbook, he talks about airport managers have to know all the aviation skills, plus they need to know a bunch of other skills, engineering, airport land use, on and off the airport, and each one of those skills may be a distinct career path in itself. So you need to know a whole lot of things. You don't have to be an expert. I'm not an engineer, but I know a lot of engineering. So we know that we gotta understand the FARs. We need to know FAA orders. We need to understand uh, advisory circulars, which if you take the money are no longer advisory. Plus we have to deal with in the state of California, Caltrans Aeronautics, the Public Utility Code, and all of the local ordinances that our city councils pass. <coughs> so what do we need to know? We need to know airport law, which is not the same as aviation law. If you've been to the basics of airport law course, they'll tell you that. You need to know airport engineering, you need to know pavement design. Why do you need to know that? We'll talk about that in a minute. And you need to know environmental stuff. I didn't even realize what environmental was till I moved to San Diego. We have burrowing owls, we have fairy shimp, shrimp, we have mesa mint. And uh, you know, when I, when I got to Sedona Airport as the chief operating officer, we didn't even have a SWIP. They looked at me like I was nuts. I said, I, I need to read the SWIP. And the guy said, the what? So I really like Arizona, Barney. <laughs> but San Diego environmentally is crazy. Plus you gotta be a manager of all the skills that we have to have uh, to lead the airport team. So where do we go for that? Well, we gotta figure out where to start. And so clearly, why don't we go to our friend at the FAA? And you know that people from the FAA are experts, and what does that mean? That they're, they're there to help you, and they're from out of town, so they're experts. They are tasked, the FAA administrator is tasked by law to promote safety, fulfill the national defense requirements, encourage development of civil aeronautics and new aviation technology. So if you look at history, that language comes right the, out of the Air Commerce Act of 1926, which was the first attempt of the federal government to regulate air commerce. It has something in that language that talks about the public interest, which is a buzzword. Public interest really didn't apply to transportation until individual rail lines in the 1800s became a system. And all of a sudden, we needed to make sure everybody had equal access to transportation via rail, and the term public interest came in. So clearly, aviation commerce today has to be protected in the public's interest. So, this is one of our favorite ACs, the Airport Design Manual. So when you hear all of these experts talk about 13A, this is it. So when Cooper comes to me and says, hey, they want to land a C-17 at Montgomery, <laughs> how much does it weigh? I said, well, you need to go to the Design Manual and go to the appendix and it'll tell you what it weighs, what its certificated gross weight is. And when Ken Keats says, <clears throat> hey, we're gonna build hangars how wide do you want the taxi lane to be between the hangars? Well, this is the, the manual that will tell you how to figure that out. I think it's 1.2 times the critical aircraft wings plan plus 20 feet. Um, and it talks about safety is the highest priority. It goes back to that, what do we get paid for safely and efficiently operating the airport? If you wanna know why we do the layout where you come out of the ramp and you can't taxi directly to the runway and you have to make two 90 degree turns as a pilot, that drives me insane. And uh, Mike Williams and I used to argue about that at length. In fact, I threatened to kill one of his professional engineers one time over that. Um, that's a whole different story over several beers. So this is the AIP manual, talks about standards and clearly the standards are all about they, that projects have to be designed to meet FAA standards, which go back to that safety. So what do we do? How do we get this, our hands around these design standards? First of all, 
as an airport manager you need to know the current status of your facilities your finances what the airport was designed for montgomery gives the critical aircraft is a king air b two hundred so we're not going to design it for a seven thirty seven so you need to understand what you have what the opportunities are for expansion and how you're going to pay for that so in the last 26 or 7 years, I've managed airports that have all had an enterprise fund that's self-sufficient, which is a blessing. San Diego is a $5 million, $5 million a year operation, and we have a very healthy fund balance. So we have the opportunity to do things that we might not be able to do somewhere else. So you need to understand your ALP. It's very important. All of you know that. We know that the aviation demand forecast drives our facilities planning, and we know that when we look at the critical aircraft, it's all about what that airport is designed to handle. And if you want to go into the technical stuff, you can ask Scott about critical aircraft, but essentially from, a, from my perspective, you know, it's an itinerant aircraft that does 500 operations, and it's all about what kind of crosswind capability it has. So. You know, when I flew in the Marine Corps, I flew helicopters. We didn't really care about crosswinds. We just turned the nose of the helicopter into the wind. But then I got out and started flying 172s, and that 15 knots of crosswind thing was really kind of a headache to me. Um, fortunately, I never banged one in, but it was crazy. So how do, we, how do we categorize that particular aircraft? Well, we look at its approach speed. And why do we want to know that? Because when we look at the airport, we want to know, is this airport a sports car or is it a bread truck? You know, so Montgomery Gibbs is a B-2 airport, which says the approach speed of that aircraft that's coming in there is typically 91 knots to 121 knots. And it's a B-2 design group, so it has aircraft with a wingspan 49 to 79 feet. So if you say, you know, my airport is an E-5, that's a big boy. So when the engineers come to you and say, well, we we're going to change the critical aircraft and we're going to change you know, your airport design group, you want to be able to go, oh, oh, wait, wait a minute. Let's talk about this. Why are we doing this? But if you don't understand those things, it would be very difficult. 13A will also tell you how to get the taxiway design group, which is new. And so I actually had to look this up when I did this presentation. It's really about how wide is the main gear wheelbase and how far is the nose wheel from the main gear so you can do the taxiway design group. So why do you want to know that? Again, when you're consulting engineers who are really good at this, and Bob and I were, had, had a talk this morning about that, you know, almost all the consulting engineers do a really good job. They're all very qualified. But you want to be able to converse with them intelligently. So again, 13A will tell you the taxiway design group. So with all of that, you can get a runway design code. And that first component is the airport approach category, the design group, and then the RVR, or a runway visual range. So when I was flying the jet for the Marines, you know, we wanted to know, because we always could land with you know, 200 feet of ceiling and a half mile of visibility, you know, what was that visibility? What was the RVR? And now we can actually tell what runways are designed to. So this is what you don't want to see on short flight. When you're an old guy, I've really raised my minimums. I didn't do instrument approaches unless I had a thousand foot ceiling and three miles of visibility, which is not that, by the way. So this comes out of the data plate for the uh, current airport layout plan at Montgomery. So it's a B2 2400 runway. So you know that's about a King Air type airport. You know, we get some G5s in there, which are always exciting. We regularly get uh, Citation Sovereigns, and we get Challenger 300s, but the airport's designed for a King Air. Uh, and so we're doing master plan updates for both Montgomery and Brown, and that will change, but we're still keeping the King Air 250, actually maybe a 350 now. Uh, but it's not going to change much. So why do we want to know that? We know the size of this airport. This is not Lindbergh Field. This is not LAX. And it's not 29 Palms. Yep. 
one of my favorite topics, P401. Why do I, as an airport manager, want to know about P401, which is the Cadillac asphalt? Because when you get a grant, typically the FAA says you're going to put down P401 asphalt. So I'm not an engineer. I don't know about fills and voids and compaction. What I do know is when it comes back from the QA lab or the QC lab, either it's in spec or it's not. So as the airport manager, the sponsor's direct representative, I get to say, well, we'll keep it and only pay you 50 cents on the dollar, knowing full well that in 10 years that asphalt will fail because asphalt has a life cycle of 20 years. Or my favorite is take it out until you get it right. I don't care how many times you have to repave it. Take it out and get it right. So P401, if you haven't been an airport manager very long, will become one of your nemesis. It's great asphalt when it's done. So the other thing you need to understand uh, is when you look at designing the airport, the economics, how the airport operates, what facilities you have, Clearly, the ALP is your friend. If on the ALP you don't have projects, the FAA won't fund them. So you need to make sure if you have projects that they get on your ALP. Um, you need to become an expert in airport land use, both on and off the airport. Most of us get those little postcards from the FAA that says, hey, something's happening. Maybe it's a crane in the airport vicinity, or maybe it's a 14-story building that happens to penetrate the horizontal surface of Part 77, which happened at Montgomery Field, and the FAA said you've got to fix that or you'll be in noncompliance, and the city actually made the builder of the Sun Road building lop off two stories of a building that was already built. So you really need to pay attention to land use. Having been the vice chair of the Air Orange County Airport Land Use Commission for 16 years, the secret to finding out what's going on with airport land use is to follow the money. Because the lawyers will come in and threaten you, but if you follow the money, you'll know who's driving what. So airport land use off airport resides with the entities, the local governments around it. So at John Wayne Airport, which is where Barry is, and I know he loves it, you know, they're surrounded by the city of Irvine and the city of Costa Mesa and it's a county-run airport. And both of those cities hate the airport, except when people have to go places. I have personally been sued by the city of Irvine twice, and we won both of those lawsuits as an airport land use commissioner. So the more entities around your airport that have land use control, the more exciting your job's gonna be. Um, how do you control land use? Uh, hazard and height zoning, uh, CC and R's, uh, all of that works sometimes if, for example, in Buena Park, when I ran Fullerton's airport for almost 17 years, we used to say that you would take off in Fullerton and crash in Buena Park. So there was some accident potential zones in the city of Buena Park. Um, last, you can acquire fee simple title to property. And why do you want to know that? Because if you have to do that, it's really painful and if you use eminent domain, people will hate you when you run their grandmother off their property that they've had for 80 years. Does it happen? Sure, it happens all the time. For example, those of you that ever fly out of LAX, at the western end, there used to be a development where you can still see the roads, where they acquired, oh, what was it, uh, 430 acres of a development because it was under the departure corridor. You can still see those roads down there if you look. I remember as a kid, you could still see the houses. So if you have to do that, it's not ever gonna be fun. So you need a plan. This, frankly, is a bad plan. This, on the other hand, is a good plan. <laughs> and lastly, you always need a well-designed plan. Thank you very much. Right. Good morning, everyone. I'm Mark Witso, and I'm the new director of Kern County Airports. And what I'm sharing with you this morning 
is uh, the real wor world effects of the change in design standard uh, for AC 5300-13A. And so, oh, okay. There you go. All right. So I'm going to give you an introduction of Bakersfield, um, the runway condition prior to the project, the original project scope, um, then the actual um, effects of the new AC, w how the project was then redesigned, the challenges with implementing that project, and then the future challenges or the tail that then 5300 carries into future projects. So. Um, Bakersfield, so I work for Kern County, um, which is, uh, you know, the owner of all the airports in, uh, in and around Bakersfield and the uh, agricultural communities around Bakersfield. Um, but it's a metropolitan area of about 600,000 people, primarily invested in uh, oil production. Uh, we're the fourth largest county producing oil in the country. Uh, heavy oil which is uh, primarily used for uh, uh, plastics and uh, diesel fuel. And um, ag is a big uh, industry in our area with uh, clementines, almonds, pistachios, um, and other uh, salad crops. And also now it's a big area for medical services. And it is uh, recognized as the second most affordable uh, area in California to live. Um, the airport, um, Meadows Field, uh, was a public use airport opened in 1940, and it has a primary runway that's 10,855 feet long, and the parallel is 7,700 feet. And we have a Cat 1 instrument approach with a uh, half mile approach and 200 foot decision height. So when the county um, looked at starting this project, we were looking to just replace the asphalt. And so uh, this is our pavement condition estimate. Um, and if the, you look at the color scheme, black is bad. And then red is pretty seriously bad. And then orange is just poor. And so we were actually um, at risk of losing our 139 certification because the runway was in such poor condition. Um, some of the cracks. Um, went uh, as high as uh, grade 13W. If you've not heard of what a 13W crack is, you can put a uh, 13 wide shoe in the crack. <laughs> That's not my foot. So we really needed to do something. And we needed to do something right away. And so the project originally was uh, scoped um, as, as basically a, a mill and uh, grind and replace, mill grind and replace uh, the, the top layer of the asphalt. And uh, there was the idea that maybe we would move the threshold uh, to make the runway longer, um, but we were just kind of pitching that to the, to the FAA, and we were retaining all the connecting taxiways to the runway. But then 13A came out. Um, well, let me go through and so we had some signage and marking improvements and we needed to do a little bit of grading for RSA compliance, the runway safety area compliance. But then 13A came out and the original estimate was it turned into a $70 million project. So um, we had longitudinal grading problems, we had taxiway connector problems, uh, the geometry of the connectors was, uh, was not in compliance anymore. We had uh, needed to do pavement removal and then both runway safety grading and taxiway grading. So now they want the runway to be the highest elevation on your airfield and they want everything else to be graded down and away from that. So at, uh, at BFL, the general slope of the airport is that it is high on the east and everything just generally uh, falls off to the west. And even the runway did not have a crown. It was just sloped um, uh, from the east to the west. 
And so after um, many different iterations, we ended up with a $50 million project over three years. Uh, the FAA agreed to a quarter crown in lieu of a centerline crown. We did limited full depth reconstruction. We removed six of 12 connector taxiways. We had to do extensive grading for RSA compliance and to fix uh, longitudinal slope problems along the length of the runway. Because of the extended reconstruction schedule, um, we needed to do work on the parallel runway so we could maintain commercial service uh, of scheduled flights during construction. Um, because of the duration of the construction, we actually closed down the project uh, in July and August because of temperatures. And then we also had to uh, enter into a one and a half million dollar reimbursable agreement for the Malzer, the approach lighting system, which is uh, embedded in the uh, displaced threshold. So we changed the uh, uh, grading, and so you can see the limits of grading in this next slide. Um, we abandoned um, many of our connector taxiways and then realign them to fit the new uh, design criteria for uh, not having uh, taxiways that can go all the way from an apron to the runway um, and, and change their location to 90 degrees. And then we also had extensive uh, lighting uh, repair um, and uh, in our, we have a SMIG system as well. All right, so here's a cross section that shows what we had to do on the runway. So before, it generally kind of sloped from east to west. So we actually had to take out a whole section on the east side and grade that down and away, and then put that crown at in between center line and the edge, so that that was the high point on the runway. Um, and then uh, transverse to the length of the runway, it would drain in both directions east and west, and that's really created uh, enormous grading issues on the east side of the airfield and leading off to the FBOs and the, and the terminal, which I'll follow on at the very end because that affects uh, taxiway alpha, which is our main parallel taxiway to the runway. So here's an example of a taxiway that was taken out. So if you uh, see it before, the uh, taxiway Charlie to the runway had generally a, uh, a straight line slope to the runway, which then also kind of sloped from, from right to left. With the new grading um, and the requirement to have um, the taxiway um, below the grade of the runway all the way out to the runway safety area, you can see this lower uh, blue line where we'd actually have to keep grading down, down, down till we got to the safety area and then try to connect back up to, um, to alpha, which would need to be like stairs. Because uh, at points, the taxiway is nine feet higher than the runway. So because of the, the grading issues too, uh, here's a good picture of from the runway to the terminal and it's, it's up you're actually looking uphill to, to the east. And that's our terminal. So uh, with all the earthwork, uh, we found uh, a good assortment of old oil lines that were not in easements, going probably back to the 20s and 30s. And uh, it took quite a bit to try to find any kind of records of any approvals for those oil lines and basically we just had to go to the historical oil companies in the in the area and just have them quick claim any and all interest to those pipelines which they were happy to do because then we were accepting the responsibility for removing those and and disposing of them and that added more than a year to the project just trying to figure that out and get that done so um, 
We are the home to an endangered species called the uh, San Joaquin um, kit fox. Um, and so they have whole condo projects all over the airport. <laughs> and um, so we had to organize the work around their lifestyle, around their seasonal habits. Um, and fortunately, most of the time, they just leave the airport and go eat at Burger King and then come back. But all the taxiway names changed because of all those uh, uh, connectors that we removed between the runway and Alpha. Um, we had to do extensive monitoring of the on-airport species. Um, and, and that runs to you know, managing the yard that the contractor is in, making sure that their vehicles are closed, because they would just take their lunches and, and take off. And um, the utility conflicts with the oil lines. And um, I am standing before you today partly because uh, the Airport Enterprise Fund ran out of money. And so there were plans on figuring out a way to uh, sell off assets to cover this project, and they didn't happen in time. And, uh, and so my predecessor is now on the East Coast. But, and, it, and it's partly because the effect of this is so uh, substantial that you might find yourself thinking you have one project and now you have three. So a $10 million project would have been a million dollars for the airport to cover. And um, that's about two years, two and a half years of what our enterprise can generate, which is not terrible. But then when you think of it being a $50 million project, it's in a whole different class. So the future challenges are that we now have to entirely replace the parallel taxiway. Uh, again, I mentioned in spots it's nine feet higher than the runway. Um, our FBOs took a huge hit with the runway project because uh, we were then using the parallel, which did have enough room for the uh, scheduled commercial flights, but we couldn't take the 767, the MD-10, or MD-11, any of the kind of diversions that we might get from time to time throughout the year. And so we weren't able to take those large aircraft. And, um, and, and with it happening over three years, you know, they kind of count on, on those uh, one-offs for uh, a considerable amount of profit. So collectively, they were saying they all lost about a million dollars worth of business a year. And so now with Taxaway Alpha having to be rebuilt, we're going to actually have to take away part of their transient apron to create a, a bypass uh, taxi lane or taxi way, we haven't quite decided yet, um, to be able to move aircraft around on the field while the taxiway segments are under construction. Um, so this was a project that, uh, the runway project was 50 million, done over uh, three years, and I'm looking at this taxiway alpha being 30 million, and I'm splitting it over five or six years. So think about the phasing cost too, because Whatever you build now, you're going to have to kind of come back and saw cut that out to do the next phase. And it's just going to add um, a certain amount of cost for redoing work you already did. And then those uh, oil lines that I told you about, well, they ran transverse, kind of oblique to the runway. So I have those same lines under Taxaway Alpha that we're going to have to work through. Now, fortunately, we own them now. Um, so I don't have to fight over that, but uh, that is more utility work to do. So I actually just like thinking about our Kern Valley Airport now, <laughs> which uh, has camping and uh, is on the, the north edge of uh, Lake Isabella, a nice place to visit. So I'll be working at Meadows Field, but I'll be taking time off at, uh, at Kern Valley. All right, thank you very much.
Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Scott Van Gumpel. I uh, work with Mead & Hunt. I've been an airport civil engineer with Mead & Hunt for almost 18 years now. Um, started as a construction inspector when I was a sophomore in college. I had the opportunity to move to Santa Rosa in Northern California, work with our office uh, there for about 10 years, and then uh, moved out to Arizona to uh, open up Mead & Hunt's office in the Scottsdale, uh, Phoenix area and uh, lead the practice in the uh, Arizona aviation market. Not the entire practice, but just the Arizona market. Um, so kind of what I want to touch on, much about what these guys talked about, was uh, some of the detail that's within the advisory circular and some of the information from an engineering standpoint that I think is important to understand uh, at any level and trying to plan for these types of improvements as early as possible. Um, because as you can see, there are some major budget impacts as well as schedule. Um, and things that really need to be considered uh, for any type of typical, I guess, typical runway project or taxiway project, whether it's a rehab uh, that might have to become a reconstruction or vice versa, if there's other ways to look at the project. So, why does it always, whenever you switch, it doesn't, ah, there we go. Uh, so real quick, uh, I'll breeze through some of these, but just an overview on 13A. We kind of discussed, uh, Rod hit most of the main points on it, so. Uh, I'll talk about what was updated between the design standards for taxiways and runways. And then we'll uh, get into something that, um, that we find very effective, and it's what we call the design concept report. It's, uh, it's a real thorough, focused, um, I would say, investigation prior to uh, preliminary design that helps us uh, focus in on some of the key elements that we've discovered over the six, seven years that this has been, uh, 13A has been in place and try to pinpoint those early so that if there is a design decision that needs to be made, if we need to discuss with the FAA about any changes to the program or talk about schedule for grant cycles and stuff like that, if it's a multi-phase project, we want to bring that to them early so that we can plan the project out accordingly. Uh, I always feel like the bad guy when we find things and got to bring it to the sponsor and talk about what the challenges are when they say, well, you know, it's just a regular mill and overlay. Don't worry about this. And, Contrary to popular opinion, I do not like to do reconstruction projects. It, uh, it's always a, a challenge. There's always subgrade conditions that can happen. There's issues that go on. And we don't want to be shutting down a runway uh, or a taxiway at an airport um, that's busy, that needs it, and impact you know, tenants and, and different airport users as well as, uh, as budget. So we want to make sure that we can keep that to a minimum. And then as Mark mentioned yesterday, that helps with the rest of the system. So if we can limit our project expenses, then perhaps someone else with, a, with another project might be able to, um, to do their project and rather than put it all into one, one airport and one project. Uh, so here's the 13A graphic again, change one. Uh, it was originally published in 2012. There's been updates ever since. Um, there's been the first major update for this since 1989. So this was a big change for us from the engineering and planning community and as well as from the, from the sponsor's side. And it took us, uh, I think, a little while to kind of figure out what, what was all in there. Um, there was a lot of changes. It was a pretty much a, a rewrite for certain sections. Um, I do have uh, interesting information. I was in an ACC conference, uh, engineering conference committee call last week, and I learned that there will be an update coming out, uh, possibly a change two, um, or 13B. It, they didn't get into specifics about it, but. Uh, the one thing they did talk about that they're looking at is taxiway geometry and fillet design, so hopefully uh, cleaning up some of that now that it's been out in the construction world for a little while. Uh, intersection geometry and signage layout, there's concerns that the fillet requiring, requiring the uh, geometry is making the signage, I guess, difficult to, to read from, a, from the cockpit. And then also uh, runway width determinations, and they're looking at some of that. Would, probably particular where it comes from going A, B to a C, D type runway system. So uh, again, grant assurances require that sponsors meet these design standards in the FAA advisory circulars. So um, consultants are well aware of what's in there and make sure that, uh, that they're bringing to your attention what, uh, what the existing conditions are for your project. All right, so again, uh, updated focus on improving geometry standards and safety through consistent design. They want everything to look the same, whether you're flying, uh, flying into LAX or SFO or anywhere else around the country, they want it to be consistent. Uh, they do want to they introduce new concepts related to runway and taxiway design, updated and reformatted tables and figures, make them more user-friendly, 
and reflect uh, changes in aircraft to larger and faster aircraft that are now coming into the system. Cleaned up text, but uh, in some cases, as we're going to show uh, in a little bit, that uh, that text was modified to become more stringent. Um, and it did create some challenges both uh, uh, on projects that we've seen over the last uh, couple of years. Can you advance it from there? Or? There we go. All right. So, um, so as it relates to existing airport conditions, and this is important to understand, um, here's an excerpt from the advisory circular. Every effort should be made to bring an airport up to current standards. It may not, however, be feasible to meet all current standards. Consult with the FAA to make determinations if adjustments to operational procedures or modification to standard is necessary. Uh, that will be uh, put in place to maximize extent while uh, maintaining acceptable level of safety. Again, safety is the, mean, the main key here. So, um, you got it working? Perfect. All right, so taxiway design standards, the update included the taxiway design group that has to do with uh, grouping a certain type of aircraft based on their main gear, uh, their main gear and nose gear configurations uh, to make it easier for them to move around the taxiway system, which makes a lot of sense. It used to be designed a different way, so now having similar type aircraft as an actual taxiway design group, uh, it makes things, uh, clarifies things a lot for us on the engineering side, so we're not checking 40, 50 different aircraft. Complex uh, geometry, multiple intersecting taxiways. Uh, they wanted to avoid wide expanses of pavement. Uh, three node design concept. They want the pilot situational awareness to have three options at a taxiway. That's left, right, or straight ahead is the preferred. Limit runway crossings. Avoid high energy <laughs> intersections. And of course, Rod's favorite, the uh, indirect access from a ramp to a runway. Here's uh, just an exhibit. This is from a project that we worked on a couple years ago. Um, this is showing the existing condition, and uh, we're modeling here an ERJ-145 as the critical aircraft for that taxiway design group. Um, you can see that the shaded sections, uh, that would be the minimum pavement that would be added to the, to the existing taxiway system here. And um, for this, uh, you can see the funky angles and uh, this becomes a real challenge to construct in the field. It's not, uh, it's not simple if you're not doing a reconstruction of the entire pavement, if you're trying to just maintain or do a mill and overlay on the existing taxiway. Um, building these and constructing them with uh, irregular widths for paving becomes a, a real challenge. Um, so this, this was, uh, you know, this has been covered a lot. I think the taxiway sections being updated there was a lot of uh, presentations and different information that was disseminated about that. So I think these are pretty well known uh, amongst everyone in the industry. The runway design standards uh, introduced the runway design code. Um, they expanded discussion on declared distances from a planning standpoint for those two items, updated RPZ standards, uh, added an interac interactive runway design requirement matrix, which is a fillable PDF form. You go and you put in your uh, what airport design code or reference code you're going to be using for the runway, and it'll spit out actually all the information that you're looking for to design to. And uh, what that does is it kind of eliminates the engineers or designers to go around and having to find all the different information it gives you right there, so you can actually just have uh, what's pertinent to that particular project or aircraft type or airport. And uh, again, they updated in tables and figures to reflect some of the new standards that was developed. Uh, so here, Rod showed this earlier again, it's runway design code, shows the existing condition of a C2, and it shows the future condition of a C3. Um, critical evaluation from our standpoint on the engineering, and this uh, came up at Mark's project, was the runway surface gradients. And so that's the slope of the runway and how you interact with uh, grade changes along the slopes of the runways. Um, the first couple things, there, there was no change in, in these conditions. It was 2% was allowed for A and B aircraft. 1.5% uh, was allowed for C, D, and E. Um, it's always important to keep those grade changes to a minimum. If possible, keep it flat as you possibly can. 
And uh, if you need to make some grade changes, then vertical curves may be necessary. A vertical curve uh, just helps smooth out the grade change. And uh, for C, D, and E aircraft, uh, that is required. For A and B, it's only required if it's greater than a 0.4% slope change. Um, so what's interesting here, though, is there, if you are moving between uh, A and B aircraft into a C and D, if your critical operations are hitting that 500 point, uh, your runway may be designed to this 2% slope, and that might be a difficult challenge to get to the 1.5%. So uh, if you are seeing a change in your aircraft uh, fleet mix and operations, um, this is something that probably needs to be discussed during the planning stage. It's a planning element for sure, uh, but engage with your engineering group and, and other folks are familiar with the airfield to see at that time if there's more than just a, a simple runway project. Um, if it has to become more than that, then it should be pretty, uh, you know, pretty available if you have available information to figure that out at that stage without uh, any kind of major costs. This thing hates me. All right, so here, here's an example of where a minor, what seems like a minor text change became uh, a rather big deal, I guess, in some of these projects. So this is a clip of the old advisory circular. I had to spend, I spent weeks trying to find this online. So I think they buried it and tried to get rid of it, but it's, uh, I got it and it's on my hard drive now. Um, so here, the important part is aircraft approach category C. Um, the surface gradient line of sight used to be its own chapter. I think it was added at a later time as it was getting updated, but now it's incorporated with the rest of uh, the runway and taxiway design sections. But here, um, what's important is two, section 2A, and here we just talked about this maximum longitudinal grade is one and a half percent. However, longitudinal grades may not exceed 0.8 percent in the first and last quarter of the runway length. It is desirable to keep these longitudinal grades to a minimum. So at the ends of the runways where people are taking off, uh, they want to make that flat so that the engines can run up and go and get us up in the air. So here's the new one. And again, it's, it's similar layout, but the Section B2, which is the same language as in before, uh, on the um, on the new advisory circular, let's see if I can get that. You can see the change. There's a just like on Word. There's a change indicator, so you know that there has been some update. Uh, I've got these highlighted yellow, green, blue, whatever, um, on my hard copy, so I can go and find out to make sure that uh, I'm not using some old standard that I remember from way back when. Um, so here in this situation, that same language, the maximum allowable grade change is one and a half percent. However, no grade changes are allowed in the first and last quarter of the runway. So this language is pretty, pretty easily understood. It's no, thou shall not. So before, it didn't even comment about it. And now uh, they make it clear about what the expectation is. So here's uh, the figure from the advisory circular, the old one. Again, end quarter, 0 to 8%. And there's a vertical curve near the PCI, or PI at, the, uh, at the end of the quarter. And it looks like it's within the, the last quarter of the runway. So um, assume grade changes would be OK in that little section there. And uh, if you needed to make it work, then that would be OK. Uh, now here's the new figure, figure one from that same, or the new advisory circular. Again, no changes, end of quarter, zero to, uh, end quarter, zero to 0.8%. Uh, however, the, the curve has changed. So now it's aligned so that it's ending before it gets into the last quarter of the runway. Um, so here it's pretty clear and it's hard to, uh, to interpret it any way else. Uh, so here's a, a project example, um, not from this region, none of these airports here, but uh, this is a project I worked on uh, about 12 years ago, designed to the old C standard. So this was C3 runway, um, excuse me, C2 runway. And uh, here we have, it's a runway extension project. We have an existing threshold. The existing slope is 0.25%. It's kind of hard to see on that graphic. I apologize. Um, you can see the proposed threshold will be located uh, about 1,000 feet down. Um, and we have a vertical curve that's going to give us a grade change of 0.25% um, on the slope. And you can see that the kind of falls off here. <laughs> now what did I do? What the heck? <laughs> it, it went to sleep. I can, yeah, I can understand that. <laughs> and 
that was the good part, too. I know. Just like Sopranos. So anyway, I'll just uh, go off my notes here. The, what you would have seen as a, as a nice run project, the, the slopes were going down, and so the design team wanted to minimize the construction costs. Um, and that project, we were moving a million yards of dirt. So uh, any, there was a taxiways, there was some runway project elements and stuff. So we wanted to make sure that we were minimizing the amount of cost on the project uh, early on. Uh, perfect. Let's get back to where we were. Damn this thing. EP, what are you doing to me here, man? <laughs> so anyway, uh, again, so ah, there we are. So if we applied the new standards to this project, um, we see that we would up carry out the 0.25 percent slope, <laughs> and uh, and we would end up with uh, a grade change at the end of the runway, the proposed threshold. Uh, would be up in the air about two and a half feet. So uh, two and a half feet, um, we had a million yards of dirt, but it would equate to about 50,000 cubic yards just for the runway section itself. Um, what's important to note is, is at the end of the runway in the RSA, we're at maximum slope of 3%, so we can never catch, um, we can never catch that because the ground kept kind of going away. So we would be adding uh, at least $300,000 to this particular project, uh, money that could be used somewhere else for another project, I'm sure. And so, and, and the next thing goes on, this has been out there for, for 10, 12 years, and there's gonna be some rehab projects going. So now we're gonna have to look at this existing condition and figure out, are we gonna have to upgrade this runway to the current design standard? Um, and that's something we are looking at right now. What's, what's interesting is a two and a half foot change of grade is not something you can just overlay. It's something you're gonna have to reconstruct the, the end of that runway just to make the grade standards work. Uh, even though there may not be any issues with the pavement sections or any kind of failure in that term, um, scheduled for an overlay, but, uh, but to make that work, you'd want to probably reconstruct or at least look at doing that. And uh, I just question if that's a really good uh, way to spend everyone's money. Uh, this project, again, would probably be a, a couple million dollar job just to make that grade change. And, and the airport's been operating safely without any issues um, with commercial service, uh, with no, no challenges with that grade change. So. Uh, again, it's on paper, it's important, it's a safety thing, um, but this might take, you might want to take another look at that and hopefully uh, work with the uh, ADO and, and everyone on, to get on the same page with what might be uh, the solution for this type of project. Uh, of course, you know, no one wants to go to mod to standards and nobody wants to deal with any uh, SOPs or, or issues with landing aircraft in and out, but uh, I think it's important to have a discussion just to see uh, maybe off the record just to see where everyone kind of lies on that and see if there's something that can be done that's more administrative than actually start spending money on construction dollars. Um, so I guess the only other point I want to make on here is the language in the AC does allow the designer to consider potential, the new AC, for runway extension projects uh, or future upgrades of the runway to more stringent aircraft approach categories. So when selecting the grade of the runway now, if it's shown and it's been planned on an ALP or a master plan, uh, it is acceptable to design to that standard. So this would be something you would want your engineering group to look at uh, as they're doing the preliminary design to see uh, if it's cost effective to meet that standard. And if not, then it's time to have the discussion about what we might do to, uh, to get to that standard. So here's a typical proje project design schedule, just a one-year schedule, um, pre-planning, master planning, ASIPs, uh, usually occur in the summertime and go, no, master plans are gonna happen whenever they need to, but. Uh, you know, anything that needs to happen early in a project before we get the engineering group on. Uh, scoping in October, take you all the way to final design sometime in uh, April 15th, uh, get ready for a May 1st bid opening and uh, apply for the grant application and go ahead and, uh, and receive the FA grant and start the project. It's beautiful. It happens in one year and everyone's good to go and no issues until you find out that you have a 13A issue. And typically that's gonna happen in your preliminary design. So we're already under the, you know, a pretty tight schedule for, for design. I know uh, everyone wants to make it a little quicker, but on our end, we, we're feeling like we're getting a little bit of pressure there. So we're trying to make this you know, work out. And um, when we find these issues, a lot of times there's a lot of discussions that have to happen and it does create a, a project uh, schedule issue. 
Uh, and the potential to lose a grant for that season after it's been planned with the FAA and has been programmed, um, nobody wants to have that discussion. So uh, one of the main points I want to make is, is it's important to really engage early and try to figure out, do I have this situation at my airport? And if I do, let's talk about it. Let's see what we need to do. Uh, what we've done on uh, a lot of projects, and we recommend doing a lot on projects that involve runways or taxiways, is a design concept report. And typically, we want this done within uh, two to three years um, of the project. And we can build a schedule. We can engage with the FAA. We can start to work through what the existing configuration looks like and how it's impacted by the 13A uh, design requirements. And I think it's uh, good to have that information early again, just so we can get it all lined up and everyone's on the same page from the programming standpoint. Um, things to consider if you need a design concept report, I would think if you have operational changes in your fleet mix, uh, creating a runway design code change, something like that, that's been discovered during the master planning process. Uh, the critical aircraft design part is part of the planning process. Uh, once it comes to the engineers, that's uh, based on existing fleet mix and then uh, whatever is in the master plan based on projections of what's in the master plan and approved. So um, if you have a runway project next three to five years, it's a good idea to take a look at those things. And meet with your consultant team and discuss these topics. So you keep it as a yearly discussion as part of the ASIP meeting, or not with the FAA, but maybe your pre-planning ASIP meeting. It's good to ask just, hey, have you guys looked at all this? Are we on the same page? Is the cost estimate accurate? Are we good to go? And oftentimes it just takes a walk out to the field and take a look at it, and you can usually see some of these changes and, and be prepared, I guess. Uh, so the report elements, it's, it's focused. It's not a preliminary design report in, uh, as, at a 30%. It's really just some key elements, and uh, it should include data collection, review record drawings, previous reports and studies, uh, perform your testing, geotechnical, and survey, because that's where you're going to know what's going on. Um, fleet mix evaluation, select the appropriate design aircraft. Uh, again, based on existing operations. Uh, operations are available through the FAA traffic management. Counts TFFMSC, because we love acronyms, database. And there's a link for it. And you can get it for every year. And it's, um, it's, it's fantastic. It's an incredible tool that we didn't have before. And then, of course, the approved master plan forecast. That's, that's another key element to that, to check both to see where we're at and where we're falling on the master plan. Uh, pavement structural section review. That's going to be the other element that's important to understand. Again, with project justifications, this is what Mark was talking about yesterday. This is going to become a bigger, uh, bigger, you know, issue, I guess, or challenge uh, if you're planning a major project. There's going to be more scrutiny on it. So you want a technical document that can back up exactly how you plan to approach the project. You know, so you have this all thought out. I think the FA would appreciate to know that it's uh, it's the train is leaving the station, and this is what we're going to do. Um, so review existing condition, update your PCI. You know, those are three to five years out. Once you have the project, you really want to keep an eye on that PCI to get a real value at that time, because things do change rather rapidly at times. Um, so you want to make sure that the current PCI is really uh, available. Uh, is it structurally deficient versus the fleet mix? Uh, are there issues in the subgrade? Do you see uh, alligator cracking on the runway? Uh, are there sections that really need to be reconstructed, or can they just be uh, simply uh, milled and overlaid because there's no structural issue? So you can check the structural design of the runway with uh, what's existing, and if it looks good, you know, most likely you're looking at a rehab rather than a reconstruction. 13A, surface grading analysis. Um, and I should add on this also drainage analysis. That's, that's key uh, because the changing grades are going to change, go downstream into a... Uh, literally into drainage you know, aspects, and it could really change how your airport looks today. If you're on an airport that uh, it's sloped one way because of you know, all the existing conditions around it and has to be to meet in the environment, uh, and you need to modify that drainage, well now, if you're in the pre-design, that's a little bit late. You probably need to go in back and, and check to do a, a drainage master plan and figure out what's really going on. Um, the existing pavement, can, or excuse me, review the existing condition for the surface gradient, but then also review the proposed pavement section design. So if, if you're not doing a rehab, or excuse me, if you're doing a, a rehab project, can you fix it economically with just an overlay? If you're only dealing with a couple inches, can you take care of that and, uh, and meet the standard and not have an issue? And a lot of times that's what we discover. It's, it's little things, not necessarily large $50 million jobs. 
Um, but then the other part of it is, you know, check to see what needs to be reconstructed because if you have to make bigger grade changes, um, maybe it's a combination of reconstruction and rehab. So um, it doesn't necessarily have to be all reconstruction or all rehab. Again, just check your pavement sections and, and marry it up with the grading analysis. And uh, project phasing analysis. It's important, uh, excuse me, environmental considerations. If, if it's already been uh, category excluded or if there's been an EA, uh, hopefully you've done that at that time before you went through that, uh, that cycle because um, if there's a change and you are now working outside your uh, sandbox, that I call it, um, that's going to be a problem. So you're going to have to go back and, and bring that to the sponsor's attention and the FAA and say, hey, look, you know, here's what we had planned. Here's what we found out. Things changed, and we need to go back and do an environmental update. Uh, phasing analysis. This is going to be key if you're going to be uh, doing a major project because you're going to have to do some public outreach. You're going to want to reach out to everybody and make sure that the airport stakeholders and tenants are well informed, uh, not the day you're running out there and starting to dig up holes, but hopefully within the year or two years so that uh, FBOs or other people that are using the airport can at least try to make it work and, and get their voices heard on how the schedule and phasing needs to be developed. And of course, updated cost estimates. You want to have real numbers as close to the, the grant application as you can. And so the more information you have, the better you're going to be prepared for the grant application. And there's not going to be an awkward conversation of, hey, guess what? We uh, just tripled the cost of this project, so can we find more money, please? Uh, best case scenario, design report results, uh, project can be completed as planned, and design team can move on to final design. You can meet that current schedule. It, it just uh, it runs that smoothly. If not, develop a plan of attack and coordinate with the FAA. Uh, can the standards be met with, uh, with, uh, with the original budget? And the benefits that, uh, that we see from this uh, on the, I guess, a dozen projects or so that we've done, or that I've been involved with at least, uh, you get a complete understanding of potential design challenges. So early in the design process, when adjustments can be made to scope and schedule and budget, um, you're going to get that information up front. And it's going to help you coordinate with the rest of the elements of the project to make sure that it runs smoothly. Um, you keep the sponsor and the FAA informed of existing conditions. It's, uh, again, it's, it's not my problem. It's all of our problem. We need to figure this as a team. So it, uh, it's not something to just hide away in a corner. This is something to bring to everyone's attention. Um, reduce schedule impacts to grant award and construction start. Um, again, we don't want to go back to the FAA and say we need to change, change horses here. Allows the design team to streamline the design process, saving time and money. So uh, we've got all the alternatives. We've discovered and we discussed all the different solutions that we could possibly go with. Once we're moving forward to a 60-90 final, all that information has already been done. All we need to do is we've got the preferred project, and that comes out of that report. And now we can go forward and actually uh, design the project without any hiccups, so to speak. And uh, again, assist with uh, early coordination and construction phasing with stakeholders and airport tenants uh, and users. I find that's uh, one of the key elements, especially uh, working at busy airports where you need to make sure everyone's informed of what the plan is and hopefully three or four years ahead of time. And with that, thank you very much. Appreciate your time. Questions? No questions? Are we uh, sorry, we're, we're just looking at the the, the time. So in, in in lieu of uh, making this move forward, we're going to roll right into the next session. So, oh, no questions. I've been told. So we're gonna we're gonna move on. <laughs> so, um, want to thank the panel and Bob for putting this together. And just a reminder that. Uh, and in your name, a donation has been made to the American Cancer Society and on behalf of uh, Swai and um, Todd. So thank you for your effort in this. Sorry about the no questions. If you have questions, you'll be able to ask them either at lunchtime or out in the foyer. Um, we're going to roll right into the next session. So we're, it's navigating tenant development. So Jim and your group, if uh, you're ready, come on up.